what we know climate change is doing is changing, is making how these cold fronts manifest themselves <laughs> or the nature of, of our event, changing it and making them a little bit more unpredictable. In this case, we knew we were getting the cold front. We could see that how it played out mm -hmm. um, and the impact it had. You know, you would want to think that there's a little bit of the climate change impact there. In this case, the cold front had really, really heavy winds. And what you want to do is couple the winds with the higher sea levels we are seeing. So climate change is playing a role through the sea levels as well. As well. And so you ended up getting this, the winds battering the coast with this heavy, and the sea, in fact, you know, coming in further. Mm -hmm. so, so it wasn't only the Negril, you remember the, the, the Montego Bay mm -hmm. as well, and the, the inundation that took place, mm -hmm. you know. So you're beginning to see those kinds of impacts of climate change changing the nature of events. Mm -hmm. If our climate change is doing is making those nature making them unpredictable but making them more extreme mm -hmm. you know so not the typical um kind of of yeah. event Man, the, the cold front came from, I think they said it was a depression coming off the, the, the US. From your opinion and your expertise as well, do you think there's a way to to plan for things like these or to, to expect? Because I know, it, you know, climate change is affecting these kinds of systems. But, you know, again, in your perspective, how do you think we can prepare or do you think it's even possible to, to, to predict things like this? Okay, so I'll probably divide the question into two. two. Yeah. All right, so let's start with the cold front. It's not so unusual to get cold fronts at this time of year. In fact, that's this typical. Yeah. Um, how far down they come, because cold fronts really are originating from way up in North America, and we get the tail end of those okay. cold fronts. But the Med Service will talk you through those. Mm -hmm. And how far down they come, you know, so that they impact us, sometimes is a function of of what we call large-scale phenomena, so things like an El Nino, mm. and you know that we're on the tail end of a, an El Nino dying out now, mm. so it probably had a little bit of an impact in the whole, how far down. But we would we do get the impacts of cold fronts mm. at this time of year. What we know climate change is doing is changing, is making how these cold fronts manifest themselves, <laughs> or the nature of, of our events. Um, changing it and making them a little bit more unpredictable. Mm. In this case, um, we knew we were getting the cold front. We could see that how it played out mm. um, and the impact it had, you know, you would want to think that there's a little bit of the climate change impact there. Mm. In this case, the cold front had really, really heavy winds. And what you want to do is couple the winds with the higher sea levels we are mm. seeing. So climate change is playing a role through the sea levels as well. As well. And so you ended up getting this, the winds battering the coast with this heavy, and the sea, in fact, you know, coming in further. Mm. So, so it wasn't only the Negril, you remember the, the, the Montego mm. Bay mm. as mm. well, and the, the inundation mm. that took place. Mm. You know, so you're beginning to see those kinds of impacts of climate change changing the nature of events. Mm -hmm. If our climate change is doing is making those nature, making them unpredictable, but mm -hmm. making them more extreme, mm -hmm. you know, so not the typical um, kind of, <laughs> of yeah. event. I say all of that to say, so climate change is introducing this unpredictability, mm -hmm. both in the magnitude and mm -hmm. how they play out, Manifest. but you can begin to see the impacts of climate change. Mm -hmm. The truth is, however, and probably this is you know critical for us in the, Car in the Caribbean, there are two aspects to how you deal with that. One is, if we really need to attribute it to climate change. So you've always heard scientists say, well, we can't take one event and turn it into <laughs> to climate, climate change. Yeah. But the truth is there is no science emerging called attribution science, mm -hmm. which says that you can take an event, <laughs> you know, and you can see what role climate change played in making the event um, as severe or extreme as it is. Now, you have to be very careful with the science. 
climate change didn't cause the event, mm -hmm. but climate change may have played a role in making it more extreme or more severe, you know, including, for example, the higher sea levels, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but there are other things, of course, at play besides climate, climate change, change, you know, um, how close you build to the, to the thing, what's the height of the seawall, those kinds of things. So that answers, so, so yeah, the science is getting there where we can actually begin to attribute. Um, we don't have that science in the Caribbean yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course it requires data and modeling capabilities. But I want to put in a plug that it's a necessary thing to move yeah. the Caribbean in the, that direction to develop that capacity especially because of our vulnerability, especially because of the creation of the new loss and damage fund mm -hmm. coming out of COP, yeah, which is going to require, if you're going to get, you know, compensation for loss and damage, then you need to attribute, mm -hmm. you know, so we need to. And it would be interesting if such an event, which turned out to be such an extreme event, you, you could figure out the climate change, the precise climate change signal. But we know climate change is playing a role. How you prepare for something like that? Well, what we really need to do, you know, is what we have been talking about, figuring out um, how climate change is playing. How, how, for example, what is the, the heights of the seas, the return periods of the storms, get the range of possible futures. That's where we're now beginning to model. Mm -hmm. And then build our infrastructure to match the range of possible futures. We're kind of behind the curve ball because what we're doing is working with infrastructure from a past climate. So, they, you know, the whole construction industry, architects, they build based on a building code. And it would put in some climate in there, but we now need to update those things mm -hmm. for the new type of, of climate regime. And so our preparation has to be, okay, we're beginning to get this. We know the kind of possible future we have to deal with adaptation mm -hmm. to a harsher climate, you know. So in the grill, we really probably needed to be looking at that seawall for quite a yeah. while. I think people have seen, you know, the sea advance closer yeah. and closer. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, I heard people saying the first time to, the, the first time they were seeing it. So I would, I mean, I have to think that it's as you said. Um, it's over time that yeah. this that this because it happened so almost so quickly in our way. It's, like, mm -hmm. it's almost like it's over time. This required some attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can actually look across Jamaica, even the new road in the east. So we just built. If you drive along parts of that new highway, you will see where they have had to build up seawall mm -hmm. <laughs> because the, the sea is actually encroaching yeah, or they re-diverted the road a little further in, inland, yeah. you know. And those are the kinds of things. It's almost like we really have to go up and go around Jamaica and look what do we really need mm -hmm. to retrofit yeah. for the climate that we now have because these were not built for the type of climate that we have right now. What is frightening is that I find, even as a scientist, that the climate change is a little bit faster than even we are predicting. <laughs> predicting. And I use last year as a good example. You know, the Caribbean has always talked about 1.5 mm -hmm. to stay alive. You know, and that is saying we must reach 1.5 by the end of the century. We must keep it there. Well, last year for the first time, from February to, to January this year, when they averaged global temperatures, we were in excess of 1.5 degrees. No, it don't mean that we hit the 1.5 threshold yet, because you have to be there for a number of years and stay above it. Yeah, for it to be normal. Yeah. For to, to say that we are at that. But for the first time in our records, we hit 1.5 degrees. Yeah. No, that is too fast for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. you know. That's what I'm saying too about about these these events is like, right. yeah. I mean, the, and we do need to, like you said initially, that plug is important because even I find in my reporting, and I think this might go over into the next question, but mm -hmm. um, sometimes I struggle to platform some of the stories because mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not that the story isn't there, and the editors might be interested in the story. Mm -hmm. They might also 
have an idea that it's credible. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when I'm putting it forward, if I don't have, like you said, the d data, um, you know, we don't have a great deal of that, then it it's kind of hard to push that. But I do see, um, and I think maybe this is an indication of the attitude of the government towards this mm -hmm. kind of thing, but I do see more reporting on it. And then I do see, um, you know, politicians like Minister um, Samuda, mm -hmm. who's been speaking more on it. Mm -hmm. um, what's your perspective on that? Do you think that they're, they're, they're getting their head in the game? No, I mean, compared to, as you said, some of these things required attention from a long time, but um, them coming on board now, are, are, what, what's your perspective on it? So, politicians, other people, I think there's a far greater recognition now that climate change is a real <laughs> phenomenon. And it's not only that it's a real phenomenon, but that it's impacting our daily lives. So again, you go back to the grill event, you know, or the Montego Bay, this shut down our biz businesses for a couple of days, you know. Fishermen. Suddenly climate, fishermen, but the hip strip as well, the, um, the small businesses, the fishermen, mm -hmm. the people who are this up this place by the roadway, yeah, you know, the impossible. The impossible. Yeah. Suddenly, we're beginning to see that climate change is not just a phenomenon out there, <laughs> but it's a phenomenon that's affecting mine and your daily life, our day-to-day -day life. I don't think it's it's missing the politicians either. I'm hearing some you know good sentiments coming out. I even read an article this morning where Minister Samuel was addressing the tourism industry, mm -hmm. and they themselves were having a conference themed around climate change. And interestingly, they were looking at seawall defenses, mm -hmm. and because they have a lot of the coastal infrastructure, yeah. you know, and he was making the point that that you need to do so. But what we have to do now. I think is move from recognition mm. to a coordinated plan, the action, mm. <laughs> you know, and I think getting that gap, mm. you know, so it's going to require a lot of pieces. Mm. One, we talk about the science, it's going to require a strong science agenda. We have to be able to attribute mm -hmm. what is the contribution of climate. We have to collect the data mm -hmm. so that we can actually make the scientific mm. case we have to invest in the research capacity. So that's one side, that's the academia. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, we have to begin to look sector by sector, almost, you know. That's the private the private sector, we have to be involved, you know, and deal. they have infrastructure like tourism, mm -hmm. but government have roads. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're going to talk about other impacts of climate change, you know, and temperature last year, heat health. Mm -hmm. And then you talk about agriculture, and you have to deal with the water. Water is yeah. kind of front line. Yeah, it's one of the big subjects um, this year. For front the line. So you, know, you, you, so you don't need everybody to begin thinking about it. So that's a kind of a second step. But then you also have to coordinate it. Mm -hmm. You don't have unlimited funds. Mm -hmm. And also, action in one sector, impact action in another. You know, you can decide, decide on an action in the water sector. You know, and say, okay, I am going to divert water from here to there. That's just, you know, me pulling an example out of the air. Once you begin to do that, you, you affect where you're diverting the water from, what purpose that water was. Was it a community? Mm -hmm. You know, was it going to agriculture? You know, um, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, so then you also don't need coordination. So you need to think about it, begin to figure out the action, they don't need to coordinate. And that's where government, has to play a critical role to coordinate all these actors. Mm -hmm. But we have to do it without a choice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's do or die time. It is, this is the action time. Very critical, you know, as you talk about do or die time. You know, cops are the major. Mm -hmm. That's the next subject too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you launch right into it. The, some of the, the conversations are about finance too and right. you know, even with an event like this where as you said the roadway was impossible for a mm -hmm. while you know fishermen, fishermen mm -hmm. were affected businesses um this was a little event just a very small <laughs> event and when you talk when the government come out and you know assessment of damage coming up to billions of dollars when you think about the stuff the the, the negotiations are cop and climate funding
what's what, you know what what's your perspective on that because you know it's it's already difficult you know we're, we're almost going there begging for funds when they do give it to us at a certain point it's like we have to provide the data to show that mm -hmm. it's this and then there are other sort of loopholes that we have to jump through as well in terms of um you know like making sure that 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 you know again people know attribution that people know that it's because it is. sometimes this fund isn't these funds aren't even funds that we're receiving it's mm -hmm. loan these are loans to so kind, right so so i think cops are important don't mm -hmm. get me <laughs> I, I think they're important yeah. because we have to make our voice you now we have to um be on the stage because mm -hmm. we're the most vulnerable yeah. you know um i think the last cop was important because of you know, over time you begin to see finally we're getting some words into the cop process. For a while we had to fight to get 1.5 in. <laughs> but now 1.5 is kind of accepting and it's in the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. For a long time we have had to fight to get loss and damage recognized. The last cop recognized it and even created a loss and damage mm -hmm. fund. All right. But of course, there are the other sides. All right, it's recognized, but it's not mobilized enough. We have pledges of how much, but the actual money that is there, there is not. And we have had that going back to other funds, adaptation fund, you know, big pledges, but you don't get the amount that, that you need. Um, but then there's the other side that Jamaica now also has to develop the capacities to ac access those funds, mm -hmm. you know. Um, uh, if we can get around the bureaucracy of the setting up of those funds and, mm -hmm. and means to disperse them, we now have to get be able to, which means, of course, we have to have the science in place mm -hmm. for the attribution, but we also we have to have the mechanisms that when they begin to disperse, we have the mechanisms to, to, to accept those funds, to manage them properly, so we have that capacity to make sure that they are dispersed towards climate change pro pro projects and that it trickles right down to the livelihood of the person. Mm -hmm. So that small business that was impacted, that, that you know, person who couldn't pass, that do we have those mechanisms in place? I don't think so yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and so we have to work that out, mm -hmm. you know, how you make that application, how you access it, how you manage it, how does it filter down, you know? So those are the parts that we're going to have to put in place, but we have to do it now, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so parallel to the globe setting up the loss and damage, we now need to be setting up so that we can tap into those. Have, you know, we'll be tapping into other funds mm -hmm. to varying degrees of success. <laughs> and then the question is how much of that translates down the line, you know, in the various sectors. But we need to we need to develop those linkages. And again, that's why I say government plays a critical role. Mm -hmm. it, it isn't just about, you know, going to the stage and negotiating. It's, it's okay. When we get it, how do we make this, make our society better, life better for that person who is feeling it the most, that kind of thing. But I was going to make a point about the action. Mm -hmm. One of the things that came out of the last COP was this recommitment, you know, the global stock take, mm -hmm. how, many, how, how much countries are committing themselves to re reduce greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. The first global stock take after the Paris Agreement said, boy, the world is not on track for 1.5. People have to reduce the greenhouse gases a lot more. more. And one of the things that emerged out of the last COP is the supposed kind of agreement that we went to up the ambition so that 1.5 can still remain on the table. Well, the reporting of those up, up ambitions are due in 2026. So not the COP next year, but the 2026 oh, COP. So 2026 COP becomes an extremely important one in my mind mm. because it's kind of the lock-in COP. Mm. It's whatever is reported there, the opt ambition yeah. is really going to kind of determine the future, oh, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So how this COP say we're not on track for 1.5 and you have to up the ambition and the charge that was given Unfortunately, not so legally binding. The child was given everybody have to up. And that's why they talked about the, you know, introducing fossil fuels for the first time, phase down or, you know, whatever the terminology there. They were very yeah. particular in the terminology. Transition or... 
transition away, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Well, I think right now we all have to be very vigilant and vocal to make sure that those ambitions that are put on the table in 2026 really take us to a future that we can live in, that we're not going for the three and four degree mm -hmm. future. So I think there's an urgency now, <laughs> you know, and that urgency is going to manifest itself. Because if you think about it, after that 2026, we're kind of locking in whatever the, the future is for this for century, while, yeah. for quite a while, mm -hmm. for probably the rest of our lives, our children's lives, that kind of thing. You know, and, and again, that's another role now for all of us, civil society, governments on the global stage to say, mm -hmm. hey, you know, this is our people's future, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Can't fumble it. They can't fumble it. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, I appreciate that. I appreciate your perspective. Um, you know, I see when I have a, some, I think I saw something about biodiversity. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere. <laughs> yeah, but that, I think, as you said, like, is not, not, Next year's cup, or the, this year, yeah, not this year's not cup, this year. is the one next it's year. 2026. Yeah. 2026, okay, yeah, so, so it's after, right. one after. But that's what I, I heard as well that the, the cup this year might not be as important as the. The one to come. Yeah, or, or the. Because, you know, there are different cups. I think there's one that's happening about biodiversity. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So you have the climate change, but you also have the biodiversity agreement mm -hmm. ones. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, that for us, big deal because, you know, those Huge. things, not the biodiversity in terms of the, the fauna and the, the flora, I think, help to. Help, it helps us a lot. I mean, they say we're, we're underdeveloped countries, but these things really help us to offset some of the, the, the right. things that we have going on. Right. The one I'm talking about, maybe I hope I'm getting the year right, is the Brazil cup. That's the lucky cup mm. for us. So, and Brazil is a home for biodiversity. I think it's, yeah, I think it is next year. Yeah, maybe I think I'm, you're right. Yeah. It's a 2025 cup. Yeah. yeah, right. It's here two years here. from that cup. So, you're yeah, right. So, right. So, that, and, and, and it's kind of ironic, kind of good, kind of. You know, that it's the Brazil Cup, mm. you know. <laughs> they, they talk about last year has been the fossil fuel cup because yeah. clearly where it was yeah, the, the was located. Middle East, yeah. But but now for the lock in of the NDCs is the Brazil Cup. Mm. Yes, yeah, it's twenty twenty five, you're right. Yeah, yeah, I said twenty twenty six. You know. That's I, Brazil is known for this biodiversity, mm. you know, so hopefully yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully we'll get some good results out of that hopefully, one. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. All right, thank you so much again. Yeah, man.